Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Eurydice Aroni. I'm from UTS and, and the ABC at, at times, or formerly from the ABC. Um, great day so far, but I, I think one of the differences with the session now is uh, we've been talking about uh, the many changes uh, uh, that confront us as journalists um, in terms of technology, the economy of journalism. But I think this next session might, uh, might be more about um, how things perhaps haven't changed so much. And I'm talking about, or we're going to be talking about interviewing because in the end we all have to face up to someone in the end and ask them those hard questions. Uh, Mark Twain said um, many years ago, this will just back me up here, that things haven't changed. No one likes to be interviewed and yet no one likes to say no, for interviewers are courteous and gently uh, mannered, even when they come to destroy. So I think we have two destroyers here today. <laughs> <laughs> well, only destroyers of, of those who have something to hide, perhaps. Yeah, courteous destroyers. Yes, courteous yeah. destroyers. Yes, Mark Colvin, uh, award-winning journalist and presenter of ABC Radio's current affairs program, PM, which I listen to nearly every day. 30 years of experience in radio and TV and uh, with many stunts as a foreign correspondent. Thanks, Mark, for joining us today. And Liz Jackson, another award-winning journalist, five Walkleys, I think it says in your thing, Liz, um, ABC journalist in radio, where I met, first met her, and uh, then TV since uh, 1986, and you'll know her probably as um, presenter of Four Corners. OK, I'm not going to ask these two questions. You must be joking. <laughs> so I will hand over to Mark first to, 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 to take off. Thank you, Eurydice. Good afternoon. Um, I hold the view that all real journalism is investigative journalism. Uh, in other words, if you're not swallowing press releases, doing what I suppose a lot of you would have read Flat Earth News by Nick Davis, so you would know the term journalism. If you're not doing journalism, you're doing journalism. And journalism means finding out stuff that's new. The old line is journalism is about telling people, uh, is about finding out things that someone doesn't want you to know. Journalism is, in another adage about it, it's about who runs this town. That's one of the, the key stories in journalism. It's about where's the money. Russell Baker, who used to write for the New York Times, one of the great uh, political reporters and foreign correspondents in America in the 60s and 70s, said that uh, journalism was largely waiting outside locked rooms and waiting for people to come out and lie to you. <laughs> and Good journalism is, is investigative journalism because it's about trying to find out where those lies are. Murray Sale, the, uh, another great veteran Australian reporter who ended his days in Tokyo only a few years ago, said there were a, a couple of great investigative stories, the two categories. One was, um, now it can be told, and the other was, we name the guilty men. And you know, so I've just given you a range of, of uh, what you might think are cliches, but uh, certainly aphorisms about journalism, and I think they all have a grain of truth. Real journalism, as I say, is about digging stuff out. It's about challenging people. You don't... I did five years on Four Corners, but you don't have to be at Four, four Corners to do investigative journalism, and aspects of every good daily program should be investigative too. So, the interview. It's, it's a range of things. You can do interviews that are very soft, and if you're doing a Four Corners story, as Liz will back me up, I'm sure, you may well do a range of interviews with people who are victims of the people you're doing stories about. So they're largely friendly interviews. You do interviews with people who are explaining what's going on. And then you will do, as Eurydice said, you'll do the, the sort of bad guy uh, interview, which involves girding your loins and going and 
looking very hard into somebody's eyes and asking them the questions. So you have to be prepared to exploit a range of talents. You have to be courteous, and you have to be charming to a degree, just that's about getting the interview in the first place very often. Um, but when it comes right down to it, you have to be prepared to sit there and do it tough if necessary. And that means that you have to be very sure of your facts. You have to really know what you're talking about. And my view is that there's no use in an interview going on a fishing interview ex expedition. You need to know what you're talking about. You need to know what you're looking for. Because if you don't know what you're looking for, you won't know when you found it. That's a very common problem that people do, you know, three-hour interviews because they don't recognize that they've got the bit that they want. So it's a combination of, of doing a lot of research, being very clear about what you know and what you're trying to find out, and being very clear about how you're going to structure that interview to get what you want. Um, Paul Lynham, who I worked with briefly at Four Corners on my first stint, brief stint at Four Corners in 1979, was an absolutely fearsome interviewer. I don't think there's ever been anyone like Paul because back in the old days, you used to have, you, we used to shoot interviews on film, obviously, before tape, before digital, and f film meant that you had 10 minutes to do an interview in before you had to take a break, and then you had about a two-minute break while the cameraman changed the magazine, and then after 20 minutes, you had about a 10-minute break while the cameraman got his hands in the bag and changed both magazines, so he had two fresh magazines. And those are always very awkward moments when you're asking people difficult questions and you're sitting there. It doesn't happen so much now because it's a quick change of tape. But uh, in those days, you had these awkward moments. You had to do a couple, a couple of other things. You had to really have a little timer in your head so that you didn't ask the, the quick key question at 9 minutes and 40 seconds. <laughs> I've done it, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I have done exactly that. <laughs> the, the ambush question, you know. Um, but uh, anyway, we all have different techniques for doing this, but a, cam a couple of the camera crews told me that Paul, during those times, would just sit there staring <laughs> hard into the interviewee's <laughs> eyes <laughs> for 10 minutes at a time. Most intimidating thing ever. I've never gone that far. Um, I'm going to play you some interviews which illustrate different things. Uh, the first one is an interview with Peter Garrett, who I've known him for a very long time. We're not friends, but we're acquaintances. He was at, at university with my sister, actually. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's an illustration of the fact that sometimes you're, you're doing stuff which is harder because you know the person, you don't actually bear any malice to them, but you're going to go in hard because it's necessary to do that. It was a story about the pink bats uh, business. What I was interested in about it was a, a report had come out condemning aspects of the government's handling of it, and I, I get very frustrated by the, what seems to me is the end of the old Westminster system of people taking ministers, ministerial responsibility. It used to be called the, the doctrine of ministerial responsibility. And it seems to me that uh, increasingly what happens is that the minister says, well, it wasn't really my fault, it was somebody else's fault, ducks it onto the department, the du the, you know, it just it's all duck shoving. So anyway, let's play that. The Environment Minister Peter Garrett is on the line now. Mr Garrett, you tabled the Minter Ellison Risk Assessment today. How long have you had it? Uh, Mark, I haven't had it for a significant period of time. It was sought for tabling and I arranged for the tabling to take place today. The opposition says that you've hidden it for over half a year now. Well, I don't accept uh, the opposition uh, making claims of this kind. Uh, well, you might as well just tell us how long you actually have had it. Well, I'm not providing sort of dates and numbers to you over the phone, Mark, in relation to this. When, when the call came for this particular uh, document to be identified, I identified it in my statement uh, when I spoke to the Parliament, 
uh, last week. I said in the Parliament that this document uh, was a risk assessment document which had been drawn on. Uh, why, why, in, in I'm the, sorry, hang on, just let me finish. Why in wouldn't, you, why wouldn't you just answer the question no, I am answering about the question. how long you've had it? I'm answering the question. It's a simple question. question. Why, um, why won't you answer the question about how long you've had this report? Uh, Mark, I'm answering the question by saying this. Um, I produced for the Parliament a statement detailing all of my responses in relation to what both the Department and I had actions had taken in relation to the home insulation program. In doing that, I referred to a risk assessment report that had been conducted by the Parliament and that was used for the development of guidelines and programs which the Department had received in April. I did not receive... But the that when is important, isn't I it? I did not... Well, I'm just when saying When did here, you know that I, there were risks of fire and poor quality well, installation? This, when? This, I'm, I'm coming to this, if, if I can. Uh, they were used uh, in the development of the guidelines for the program received by the department in April and those guidelines came through to me for approval and I approved them then on the basis of all of the material that the department had put together in relation to developing the guidelines themselves. Now, subsequent to that, we continued the process of considering both the stakeholder comments uh, the engagement with industry and training bodies and we then brought forward additional measures in relation to the program building on the guidelines that had been established as a consequence of drawing upon that risk assessment report and many other content So we can see that you had warnings before the program started. You say that you tried to build the, you tried to guard against those things in design of the program, but then you had a series of warnings during the operation of the program. Why did they essentially go unanswered? Well, I think it's really important, Mark, for me to clarify what's being identified as warnings as to what they actually are. In many instances, what the opposition are describing as warnings are issues that are raised in stakeholder meetings that I actually have either convened or alternatively uh, my department has actually held and in fact uh, the experts meetings and other meetings that have raised those safety issues and other issues in relation to the program have been actually instigated by me to enable me to make decisions as to whether I need to add to the safety requirements or training under the program. But and what people are asking is why the action was so long in coming. Well, in, in actual fact, as I detailed to the Parliament, and I'm happy to go through you at great length, I know we don't have that much time, I've also, on the basis of advice received, then proceeded to take actions in relation to any issues that are raised. Now, it's important to remember that we, amongst many other things, established specifically a national training module on the basis of advice and concerns that cert There's more along the same lines, but I think what I'm, one of the things I want to talk about is the fact that I'm very lucky to have the ability to do an interview at length, and uh, that's increasingly, again, in the sort of world of journalism, that's increasingly rare. But I do think that uh, adding the, that kind of interchange, even into programs like Four Corners, into 7.30, which is, is becoming more rare, and I think that's a, a great pity because I think the dynamic of a, a really uh, confrontational interview, it makes terrific radio and it makes terrific television. Um, continuing with the theme that investigative journalism is just journalism, um, the next interview is with a man who'd just been inside, he'd just been released from one of Colonel Gaddafi's jails as a political prisoner. The town of Zawiya, west of Tripoli, is one of the focal points of the conflict in Libya. It's been in the hands of rebels for days, but pro-Gaddafi forces have been trying so far without success to recapture it. Mohammed is a young man living in Zawiya, just a short time ago, he described the situation there. The city is under the control of the youth movement. I mean, it's, it's completely under the control, but it's surrounded by the Gaddafi authority. I mean, it's surrounded by artillery, tanks, but the city itself is, is, is under control. I mean, government, they have no control over the city. 
So how are you defending yourselves? How is Zawiya defending itself if it's surrounded by Gaddafi's tanks? Yeah, they attack the city from time to time, but now there are some soldiers, they're fighting with the people inside the city. Do you have any so anti-tank have... weapons? No, they don't have anti-tanks. They have tanks and they have light weapons. I mean, they have guns and machine guns, and this is what they defend the city. So you have with. some tanks inside the city? Yes, yeah, they have some tanks, yeah. So if, if Gaddafi really wants to take it over, there's going to have to be a tank battle, essentially, or he's going to have to yeah, use the air force. Which is very difficult to use the tanks inside the city. I mean, it's, uh, unless they want to destroy the whole city. And what about the air force? Have you been bombed at all? The city, no. There are airplanes around the city. From time to time, you hear the airplane, but there is no bombs by the airplanes, no. Why do you think Which they're is, not bombing you, given that uh, you're... It was my mistake. It was, uh, I've got the two interviews. I've got, a, I've got a couple of interviews in my head, and I got them mixed up. That was clearly not the one I was thinking of. But the principle remains the same. What, I'm, what I think you have to realize is that, again, you need to know as much as you can about the subject. But there's also a question of empathy, also a question of trying to put yourself into a, into a position in that case, if you, and it, do, it does help if, uh, if you've been in a few dangerous places yourself, you can actually form a mental picture of what you're talking about. Uh, but what, we're, what we've been trying to do throughout the Arab Spring with interviews like that is to advance the story to, to bring to the world voices that, they are, that the world otherwise would not have heard. And I would argue that they wouldn't, in previous conflicts, they wouldn't have been heard. We, we were getting through to people through a combination of Twitter and Skype and Facebook. And I think Jess Hill may have been talking about that in another session or maybe going to. Um, but yes, we, as I say, advancing the story through knowing a lot about the subject, again, trying to empathize, empathize with what's going on. I very often will not go in to an interview like that with very much information at all. So you have to be very quick thinking. You're thinking on your feet, and you are trying to just draw information out quickly and economically, uh, but without, uh, you know, uh, being rude or discourteous to the interviewee, who is often in a very, very stressful situation. The third and last uh, extract that I think you might listen to is about the Goldstone report into Operation Cast Lead, the uh, Israeli attack on Gaza, and Goldstone came out with a report which was you know, reasonably even-handed but was not nearly even not nearly um, pro-Israeli enough for the Israelis. This is an interview with the Israeli spokesman, Mark Regev. In New York later today, the UN Security Council is expected to be asked to debate the Goldstone Report, the result of a UN Human Rights Council commission to investigate Israel's invasion of Gaza earlier this year. The report, headed by the former South African judge Richard Goldstone, found that both sides, Israel and Hamas, had committed war crimes. The Israeli government spokesman Mark Regev is in Melbourne at the moment. I asked him first why Israel had flatly refused to cooperate with the work of the Goldstone Commission. I think because clearly we saw that it was going to be terribly biased uh, from the very beginning and there was little point in cooperating. But didn't uh, not cooperating make it more likely that it would be biased against you? Well, I'm not sure there was much of a chance anyway. I mean, they approached a number of people before they approached Goldstone. Uh, the most famous, I think, of the people they approached, they approached Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland, former UN uh, Human Rights Commissioner. And she refused because she said, she said the mandate, mandate of Goldstone was just so, so biased, openly, uh, extremely biased, that there was no point. Richard Goldstone has a very high reputation from his previous work. He is, in fact, I believe, Jewish by origin, in, origin himself. Why were you suspicious of him? Well, it, it doesn't have to be personal, but I, uh, frankly, I would have more respect for him had he followed the lead of Mary Robinson. I mean, this Human Rights Council of the United Nations, I mean, it's called a Human Rights Council, but the people who sit there are countries with atrocious human rights records, countries like Syria, Sudan, Somalia, Saudi Arabia, 
and they've used the council, instead of talking about human rights, they use it as a vehicle just to attack my country. You could say that about the whole United Nations. It's got a lot of bad countries in it, but you still cooperate with the United Nations. But the council is unfortunately dominated by these sort of countries who, as I say, have got atrocious human rights records and just use it. I mean, they've, they've in the last few years since they've been established, they've published some 25 resolutions, 20 of them have been pointed against Israel. And I'd remind you, Israel is the only country in the Middle East that has a free press, that has a free trade union movement, that has free universities, that has elections that really matter. I mean, the whole idea that this Human Rights Council is totally focused in this anti-Israel agenda, it's not something that just I say. Both the previous Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, and the current Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, have both criticised the Council for its anti-Israel obsession. But they didn't criticise the Goldstone Commission, did they? And the Goldstone Commission was apparently even-handed in, in that it said that both sides had committed war crimes. Well, I'd remind you, if I could, that all the democratic countries that sit on the Human Rights Council, Japan, South Korea, Canada, the European countries, they all opposed the Goldstone Mandate. They all they refused to support it. And I think a lot of those countries today are trying to bury this document as quickly as possible as possible because everyone understands the danger in, ab in adopting this report. But you've already said that you don't accept that it should have happened in the first place, but let's talk about its conclusions. As I say, that it, it said that both sides had committed war crimes. First of all, do you know what they actually did? They came into the Gaza Strip, a, a, a territory controlled by a very violent and authoritarian regime run by Hamas, and they conducted public hearings. Now, having a public hearing in that sort of circumstances, it's like having a Stalinist show trial. They heard exactly what they wanted to hear. They, they, heard, they heard all this testimony just condemning Israel. Well, of course, no one can say anything against Hamas because if they do, Goldstone leaves, Hamas will, of course, take immediate violent retribution against the people of, who'd speak out against them. It, it was just a show trial. It was a travesty. Let's just talk about the specifics, though. What about the allegation that your troops actually killed civilians on occasions deliberately? Civilians were unfortunately caught up in the crossfire in Gaza. That's a fact. And we're actually investigating this ourselves. We've got some 100 investigations going on at the moment. More than 20 have already reached the stage where there's a, the military police have launched a criminal, criminal investigation because we do hold ourselves to a higher standard. But the assumption that Israel as a policy targeted innocent civilians is simply not true. We made every effort during that conflict not to target civilians, we made every effort to avoid seeing civilians caught up in the crossfire. We dropped leaflets, we warned people to leave combat areas, uh, we even made cell phone calls to all the numbers in the Gaza directory. We made every effort possible to By avoid seeing that, civilians. You seem to be prejudging the efforts of the inquiries you've just been talking about. You're no, basically not, saying have... that they will find your soldiers not guilty. Well, I don't know because there can, of course, be specific circumstances where soldiers acted not according to their orders. But if you ask me, was there a policy to take every effort possible to avoid civilian casualties, there was such a policy. That was clearly the orders given to soldiers going into combat. Was white phosphorus used as an incendiary device? Yes, it was, and that's totally in accordance with international uh, uh, law. NATO forces use white phosphorus in places like Afghanistan and other places. You're allowed to use white phosphorus. For signalling, you can use it for making smoke cover. I think I wouldn't be surprised if the Australian military uses it as well. It's not legal to use it as an incendiary device against people, though, is it? Well, definitely not, and we didn't. Mark Reger, the Israeli government spokesman, speaking to me from so Melbourne. I've included that because, as I say, it's about um, waiting outside locked rooms, waiting for people to come out and lie to you. I'm not suggesting that Mark Reger is lying, of course, but he is one of the... Uh, most effective spin doctors in the world. You're not going to come up against a PR uh, person more effective than Mark Regev. He's had a lot of practice at it and he's very, very good at it. So I think that you will never get much further than that. But what you have to do is just persist and persist and ask the questions. Sometimes asking the questions is enough. Sometimes getting that little psychological pause in the middle there is enough. So, I'll ask you for a couple of questions now. I'll, I'll ask you a question. Sure. <laughs> One thing I love about listening to PM is the live, 
the liveness of it. Can you talk a little bit about the difference that you found between uh, interviewing for, for, for pre-recorded and interviewing <coughs> live and what you think the strengths and weaknesses are of that? Yeah, uh, the main difference I think is that in the way I would structure an interview is that uh, if, if I'm pre-recording is that I won't necessarily start off really, really hard. I might, in fact, with a pre-recorded interview I have a rough rule of thumb that I'm going to drop the first question and answer and then let them get warmed up. With a, with a live interview I'm just going to go straight in hard. Um, you know, two barrels straight to the face sort of thing. Um, with a live interview, it's, uh, you know, five or six minutes on air, bang, 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 bang. With a pre-recorded interview, I might do, uh, you know, a 15-minute interview. Increasingly we do, and this is a great thing about the digital era, increasingly we do, you know, I'll do a 15-minute interview, run five minutes or six minutes of it on air and put 15 minutes on as a listen again or podcast on the website later. Those are the main differences, I are think. Are you finding that many people are downloading the whole, the unedited versions the, of the interviews? Yeah, I think so. Yes, yes. I, I've yeah, heard I that the figures are pretty, yeah. pretty incredible. I haven't seen the figures lately, but I think they've been pretty good, yeah. Yeah, uh, um, your executive producer was telling me last week. Yeah. So what, what, do you think, what do you think people gain from, from the live aspect? Because there's so little live left in some ways. So yeah, I think, well, there's still a fair bit of live on... On radio. On radio, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, what do, what do the, the listeners yeah. gain? I think there is a sense, there's that sort of frisson of what's going to happen next and what could go wrong. Um, I think for the interviewee, there's the edge, you know, again, what could go wrong. And uh, you can take advantage of that. But also, just to interrupt, I mean, a lot of politicians have increasingly, in relation to Four Corners, refused to do interviews that aren't at least as live. Yeah. And what they mean by as live is that you're not allowed to cut anything yeah. from the interview without that being negotiated. So you're in the position that, where you have an absolute allocated period of time. I've had this with Tony Abbott, I've had this with John Howard, where they're counting down the interview time. You, yeah. know, you can see them going seven, six, five, four, three. Yeah. And they're answering the same question, or rather they're giving the same answer over and over again, but the rules are as live. It's not the case, I mean, we, we've sort of taken the position that we can't accept that now. Yeah. Um, that, but we, we, we often and get a very small... that's why I ran the, the Garrett interview, because so, I mean, they trying feel to that They say, we don't trust it. you. You just you know? have to keep on coming back and yeah. say, you, you know, if they're trying to give the same answer every time, which is, as you say, an incredibly common and really toxic technique, I think. Of using up the time. Mm. And yeah. as I say, it's, it's, it's not our format, but they insist on it yeah. because they feel and they say explicitly, we don't trust the way you're going to cut. Yeah. And you say, <laughs> which is sort of pretty insulting really, to your yeah. journalistic ethics, but that's the issue why some people actually prefer it, is all I'm saying, mm. rather than mm. dreading it, they prefer it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there was a little one of those little internet uh, excitements a few months ago when uh, in Britain a, uh, a reporter for ITN or one of the, no it was a pool, a pool reporter had done an interview with Ed Miliband and uh, he blogged about it and attached the video, Ed Miliband being the British Labour leader and Miliband just gave him the same answer again and again and again. It was quite robotic. And um, when that happens, I think, I think it's great when, when it gets exposed. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question. Mark, interesting to hear your um, thoughts. Uh, my name's Marilyn Vale from Fairfax Media. Hi. Hi. I was wondering, do you have um, some favourite killer questions that always work? Look, I... Uh, Favourite questions, I have, a, I have a couple of other people's favourite questions. I was always very fond of the great Richard Carlton question, the, the day that uh, Hawke had knifed Hayden to take the Labour leadership uh, on the day that Fraser called the election in 1983. And his first question was, blood on your hands, Mr Hawke? And Hawke <laughs> went apeshit. Hawke was just furious and called him a disgrace and a grub and all kinds of things. Um, I loved the question that Jeremy Paxman of uh, Newsnight in, in Britain asked Norman Lamont, 
who was John Major's Chancellor of the Exchequer on the day when I think uh, Britain had had to pull out of the ERM and uh, the pound had dropped by billions and billions and billions. And uh, he came on and was sitting there, he had a rather smug face, Norman Lamont, he was sitting there looking smug. And Paxman asked him what appeared to be the ultimate Dorothy Dixer as a first question, which was, um, do you enjoy being Chancellor of the Exchequer, Mr. Lamont? And he, and he sort of licked his lips and smiled and said, yes, I'm, I, it's the best job I've ever had sort of thing. You know, I, I really like it. So challenges, blah, blah, blah. Second question, of course, was, are you going to miss it? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to, to give a more sort of, you know, technical answer to your question, the best, uh, the best questions are very often why, how, and any sentence beginning with but. <laughs> Chris? Um, I agree with you, Mark, on what you're saying on the uh, importance of the art of interviewing and also what you're just saying about how it's, it's best conducted. And I think, in fact, your, you and your colleagues on PM are some of the best exemplars of that. But Thank I thought you. that interview that you played with Mark Regev in many ways shows the limitation of the form um, because... The blocking is so insistent. I agree. And it, what it does in effect, I think, I mean, what it's done from the, for the coverage of the Middle East in Australia, I think, is that there's very little that you would read or watch um, or listen to on Australian media now about the Middle East, particularly to do with Israel and Palestine, which is terribly informative. And really, you have to go to other sources. And that the... Um, the, the fact that particularly with the ABC that one has to accept Mark Regev's performance um, a, think, as a... As a to as be a, fair, within a, a broad context of a lot of reporting to the contrary... Oh, yes, I agree. Yeah, I agree. It wasn't just, you know, in a vacuum. No, 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 I agree with that. But what I'm saying is that if you are really interested in what's happening in the Middle East now, then you, you'll get a much greater... Um, range of views and more informative views if you, for example, read the Israeli press in English online or you read some of the Middle East and Arabic press um, online. Well, of course you will because they're specialising in that. You know, we're, we have maybe one thing about the Middle East a fortnight, you know. And you what, I'm, what I'm suggesting to you is that the, the, the spin versus the interviewing form doesn't allow that interview form to actually reveal the depth of information that you can now get in other ways. And that, no, I, that's because of the role of spin doctors versus the interviewing. I, I agree up to a point, but I think you've got to try. I, I didn't play that as, as some kind of triumph of my interviewing. I played it as an indication of how difficult it is. But I don't think that you don't do those interviews as a consequence. Sometimes you'll lay a glove on them. Very, very, very seldom now will you actually get a political interview or an interview, interview of that nature in which somebody actually concedes error in any way. But you can, as I say, put things into perspective. You can put a, uh, you can challenge the spin. Hmm. Yeah, we had had Goldstone on, actually. Yes, yes, yes. I'm not saying that the ABC is un is, um, doesn't have a balanced coverage or whatever. I'm not no, saying no, no, it doesn't give a fair bit. That's what I'm a fair about point. You, yeah. You're yeah. saying that we, we don't cover the spectrum and we had had Goldstone on and... No, I'm not saying that you don't cover the spectrum. What I'm saying is that the interview form in the face of that sort of spin doctoring and also what Liz is saying about, you know, the difficulties of the form, the live, as live form on, PA, on Four Corners, creates a real impasse that it's very difficult to get past. But I still think you want to hear people held accountable. You want to hear the questions. Yeah. And I think the, the viewers and the audience are smart enough to realise that the questions, there are interesting questions being asked and not answered. Yep. And although there are no concessions being made, big concessions are rarely made. You know, I mean, you rarely go to someone who, who you have banged to rights and ask them a question. They say, gotcha, you're, you're yeah. right, Gov, I'm completely guilty. Um, but surely and, that's and I think, I know what you're saying, and I, I appreciate it's, it's both frustrating for the, for the listener as well, but I think it is really important, and I regard it as really important in the work that I do, that, that the people who have the power and exercise the power in ways that are questionable and ways in which they should be accountable are actually publicly held to account whatever the limitations of that are. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right, but, uh, you know... I I think, okay. Maybe it's because it's okay, my job. Let's, you know? let's continue this um, 
Thank you. Oh, have you got a question? One more question for Mark? Uh, yeah. Because we will take questions. Yeah. We will at have the end more questions at the end too. Yeah. So maybe we'll move on to Liz while she's got her mouth open. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark said a lot of things with which I agree. I thought I'm, I was going to call um, this section of my presentation. I was going to call it "No One Ever Died from Being Asked a Question." And the reason I thought of that was that the day I started work at Four Corners, I took over Marion Wilkinson's office and pinned up on the clipboard, just about at eye level, was this scrap of paper which had written on it, no one ever died from being asked a question, which I never really quite understood, but took it to heart in terms of what Mark's saying, which is, if you're worried one way or the other, just ask it, you know, no one ever died from being asked a question. So with that sort of spirit of starting at Four Corners, I'm going to, the, the examples that I've got, which are many too many, are all taken from Four Corners. And they are interchanges because this is an interviewing session. And I suppose the case that I want to make is that even though a lot of the interviews are pre-recorded, a lot of them aren't live, it's a documentary program, that I am for interchanges and for more interchanges and for long interchanges, even though it is in the documentary format. And that I think that the drama of the interchange and the capacity to hold people accountable from the interchange is something that is different from just butting one side of, you know, you can, you can butt a grab against another grab, and in that sense, well, you've got somebody saying one thing, somebody saying another thing. But it's, it's different to hold people answerable. And I think that that's, what, in a sense, what I feel is important in terms of... It's, it's obviously not appropriate in every kind of story that you do. I mean, you might do an observational story on a remote Aboriginal community to see how it works, and really, you're not asking questions. You're just showing, and the power of showing can be enough and you don't want an intrusive interviewer. But I think that the capacity for the interviewer to have useful in interchange is underestimated and I think that viewers appreciate it. I mean, they see the interviewer as asking the questions for them. And also, I think, that, I think the second point in a way is that they also see the reporter and they get a sense of who they are too. And I think that is, in a sense, part of you know, what people like Joe Rosen hold is very important, but some sense in which you also establish who you are and that's going to be taken into account in terms of how people perceive the piece. So in terms of the, the first interview I want to show, which won't start yet, and in a sense, it's a, it's a very old interview. It's an interview that was done in 1996 with John Howard, shortly before he became Prime Minister. Um, I've, shown it, I've chosen it for a number of reasons. I mean, one, because in terms of the kind of preparation that Mark was talking about, we took it very seriously. I mean, we thought to ourselves, what is the point? What is the purpose that we're trying to get out of this interview? What is the strategy? And we actually had a strategy developed, you know, because this was going to be a big interview, it was going to be the core interview. What research are we going to need to back up that interview? And this wasn't so much a preparation thing, but always remembering in the back of your mind that listening is incredibly important and that whatever strategies you have must be adapted to what somebody says. I mean, there's nothing worse than an interview which is just a list of written questions. I mean, I'm for writing a list in case panic sets in, right? <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not. Not we, at all. I like to that. have a few just written here. Like, I've got yeah. things written here and I'm not looking at them. But... Um, so that's what it's chosen for. And very briefly, so you understand the strategy, I mean, in 1996, this is the election that John Howe's just about to become Prime Minister. There's a view in the electorate that Paul Keating is just perhaps a little bit too out of touch, you know, this Republic stuff, this reconciliation, this, um, you know, engagement with Asia, sort of uneasy. There's a sense in which, and, and that's, that's a feeling which obviously the opposition want to exploit. And the program was actually called An Average Australian Man because that was John Howard's self-description in, in an earlier, in the biographical soft part of the questions, it was, if you're given three words, how would you describe yourself? And the answer was an average Australian man. And this was said in the context of someone who'd said in a previous Four Corners, John Howard had described himself as the most conservative leader the Liberal Party had ever had. So clearly what was happening in the campaign on which we were reporting on was a shedding of the more conservative views and a move to the middle ground. So the, the central purpose of the interview was to show when and why that shift occurred. Not to discuss, these are your current policies now, but to actually identify and bowl the ball straight down the pitch on the line of when did you change your view about X? And I think the unexpected nature of the style of questions produced what I think was um, the, the kind of result that we wanted. Um, it is a long time ago. I think I'm young and eager. <laughs> and, <laughs> And, and it's long for television. That's the other thing I want you to bear in mind. It's long for television. It's two minutes, 
47 seconds. So brace yourself for 2 minutes 47 seconds because in, in a documentary format, that's long. John Howard once proclaimed, in politics it's more important to be right than to be popular. Now he's not so sure. Take Medicare. One of the other things that voters are asking themselves now is, what does John Howard stand for? Mm. So I'd like to run through a few of the issues sure. that will be big in this debate, Medicare being the first. When did you change your mind about Medicare? Uh, what part of it? That, well, for instance, that it was a total disaster. When did you change your view that Medicare was a total disaster? That's I, I, have, I have accepted for some years now that the Australian people like Medicare and they want to keep it. When did you change your view that bulk billing was a rort? Once again, the Australian people made a decision that they wanted to keep bulk billing. And uh, they, they therefore... Um, and look, in, 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 on all of these sorts of issues, anybody who has the same view year in and year out, year out irrespective of the expression of public opinion, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is stupid. So you changed your view on bulk billing and Medicare generally mm. because of public opinion? They, public opinion played a very major part on both of those issues, yes. What do you think of the view that politicians should stand for what is right, not what is popular? I think, I think on most occasions that is absolutely correct, but it must also be tempered by the recognition that if people express a definitive view, you have to accept that their right to make the decision is superior to yours. So those are your words in 1986, that mm. a politician should stand for what is right, mm. I remember not them. what is popular, but I remember you've now them. changed I that I view I to, I to accommodate... Remember them. I remember them very, very clearly. There's, re there's, there's really no inconsistency. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of things that I argue for that aren't necessarily popular. But, um, you say that uh, you, you're prepared to take unpopular views. I mean, I think that you'd have to concede there are increasingly few areas in which you're prepared to take the unpopular position. What are, what are the unpopular views that you, you now hold? I think if you went out and did a poll on foreign investment, most people would say they're against it. But uh, uh, I would not like there to be an increase in foreign investment, but I support the need for Australia to take continued amounts of foreign investment. I mean, there are numerous areas like that. Any other bitter, unpopular pills that you'd like to tell us that you, you have? I think foreign investment is a good example. <laughs> now, <laughs> actually, what I want to demonstrate is just one more short excerpt of that, because in a sense what we did was we took every aspect. We took Medicare, industrial relations, immigration and the Republic, and in a sense framed each one. So by the end of the hour that we had with John Howard, it's looking a bit more like this. This is, this is a very short one. This is from the same interview. If we play the next one. Well, let me make it perfectly clear that I haven't abandoned one principle when it comes to industrial relations. I'd like to talk about industrial relations. Do you mm. accept that you've changed your view on industrial relations? Where? From certainly your policy position has changed. You, would you accept your no, policy position No, I don't. Position you tell me changed. where I've changed. Do you not accept that the policy... No, no, no you, are, you, are putting, okay. you are putting to me that I've changed, and I say no. Now I'm asking you to tell me where I have changed. In 1993, you advocated a $3 youth wage. Have you changed your view about that? I have on that. Were you correctly reported in 1994 saying that the coalition would scrap award-based minimum wages? In 1994, mm. I don't remember that particular attribution, but I've never believed in lower wages, never. $3 That's, is a low wage. Uh, uh, but that was connected with job creation for young people. <laughs> so, I mean, that, I mean, I think it's pretty clear what the, what the strategy... I mean, in a sense, it's not quite when did you stop beating your wife, but it's, it's, it's to take... It's to, phrase the question in such a way that an assumption is made about an assumption that's a, it's a fair assumption which the views have changed and then seeking to see whether or not you're going to get agreement or not and then responding appropriately and also the importance of having to hand. I, I like that second one because I can't remember whether I really was thinking, golly, I've got to come up with something fast. <laughs> I'm really... Can I just ask you, because uh, you did remind me of, of um, how great it is when you're at Four Corners or a program mm. like that and you've got really a lot of time to think 
about it. Did you game out the interview? Did you yes. sit down with the researchers and the, and the producer and, and uh, you know, what's he going to say if I ask him this? Because um, I think that's a, a, I used to do that a fair bit at Four Cs. I certainly thought about it and I certainly discussed with the producer and researcher. You know, we sort of gathered that this was the line, you know, having done a lot of research and, and found out what had been said in the past, which are really strong statements, mm. which he'd backed away from considerably. And so we thought about what were possible answers and what would be possible ways to go, yes, and I think that was, that's a, I'm glad you brought it up because it's part of the reason that I showed it, is in, is in a way to say, think about, yeah, precisely, think about what you're going to ask and think about the form in which you ask it such that you'll get a certain response and if you get that certain response, which way are you going to go? I mean, if he says, well, I've never changed my views on Medicare, well, it's like pretty clear. And if he says, well, of course you ought to change your your views according to public opinion. Well, you also know that he's on record precisely as saying that politicians shouldn't do what's popular um, and has always seen himself and prided himself on precisely the fact that he's a man true to his beliefs. And I think it's only really in 1996, I think that's a very particular time in Howard's political history where I think he is more accommodating. I think he sort of has, you know, can arguably claim now more, you know, with, with, with greater credibility that he's stuck by his principles. But we did precisely what you're saying, mm. yeah. It's a very useful technique. I think uh, Peter Manning in the, the Peter Manning days at Four Corners, Peter often used to just take the position of the interviewee and then you'd just go through it, as I say, gaming it out, trying to work out what, what the difficult areas would be and how you would deal with them. There's one thing, I, perhaps I should leave this interview, but I should just comment on the fact that the one comment that came out of this profile that we did on John Howard was in fact not one of those. It was a Dorothy Dixer. It was a Dorothy Dixer when I asked him, can you tell Australians, you know, what kind of Australia you as Prime Minister would deliver in the new millennium to? And he said, I would like to see Australia comfortable and relaxed about the past, comfortable and relaxed about the future, and comfortable and relaxed about the present. And the only credit we can take in terms of that actually being the takeout message was to pick up on it. And I think that's important as well in an interview. I mean, I think it probably would have become noticed in any event, but to immediately pick up on it and say, is that comfortable and relaxed, the kind of Australia that most people want to see? And his answer was fantastic, I thought. He said, um, or, or I said, do you think people want something more exciting? He said, you can't be excited unless you're comfortable and relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was the best line in the whole thing, frankly. Tell and people later on a roller coaster now. <laughs> just get comfortable and relaxed and then you'll get excited. So just to go back uh, this and amplify what Liz is saying, it's about the listening. Every interview is about the listening. It's about uh, you can have a prepared structure for the interview, you can have done your research, but the really important thing, as I say, I don't go in with any written questions at all. Um, I was, somebody gave me the advice very early in my career never to write down more than three questions. I always found that very, very useful because it frees you to listen. And if you're listening, you can make the interview organic. So, Liz, yeah. sorry. So, I guess the takeout from that is, is, is no, don't be afraid in a documentary to run two minutes, 37 seconds. I mean, those of you who found the two minutes boring, don't. But I think that the engagement um, element is, is, is really, can work in documentaries and, and is seen less and less often in my, in my view. I mean, the one I've chosen next perhaps is, is actually a very short, very short, and I suppose I picked it just in case everyone thought I was never anything but a bull terrier. So it's, um, it's just to show a different style of interview, but also a sense in which you're still holding someone accountable, but it's someone who's much more vulnerable and someone who you have to ask the hard question, um, but you have to ask it in sort of a sense of respect for who you're talking to. And it's a, it's a, it's a very, sh I think it's, it's actually one minute 27 seconds, but there's very few words uttered. And I guess the message from this one is that the pause can be as important and allowing people, giving people the pause, can be as important as jumping in. You know, you've got to sometimes give people the space. I need to set it up pretty briefly. I'll try to set it up briefly. It's from a program made last year called A Dog Act, and it's about when five young white men kicked an Aboriginal man to death on the banks of the Todd River Bank. And previous to that, they'd been driving their four-wheel drive down the Todd River where they knew that Aboriginal people were sleeping. It was shortly, it was before dawn, um, and they were scattered like a flock of galahs, or what an eyewitness said. Um, and firing a replica gun 
to, to, to frighten them. And the program was made shortly after the men were sentenced and the driver of the vehicle is a young man called Anton Clo Selwyn Cloden and his father, sorry, he's Anton Cloden and his dad Selwyn and it's an interview with Selwyn Cloden. And the purpose of the show wasn't really to say, look, aren't you racist? That wasn't really the point. The point of the show, in a sense, was to say, why did Alice Springs find it so difficult to accept that people saw this as racist and indeed that the judge found it to be racist? It was like, so it's, it was a picture of a town in denial, and in this case, a father in denial. Selwyn Cloden and his wife, Ruth, are on their way to visit their son in the Alice Springs jail. They feel his sentence, a minimum of four years, is excessive, and Anton Cloden is appealing it. Cloden's behaviour was judged to have encouraged the assault, and he was also guilty of endangering the life of a camper. His father rejects the judge's finding that there was a racial element to his son's crimes. I just thought, well, it's a, a comment made by someone who doesn't know him. It was made as a result of his actions. It was perceived that it was a racial action by certain people. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe Anton had any racial issues in regard to that. That's it. It may seem strange out of context, actually, but I think that I, I find sometimes when people are struggling for an answer and the look on their face tells you as much as they could if they were speaking. And, and the question had to be asked was, you know, when he says he was never racist, that the judge had made it, the judgment on the basis of what he'd done. I mean, saying that he didn't know him was not really to the point. The question was what he'd done. And if you want one last one, or should we mm -hmm. go straight to questions? The last one is... is um, it's also um, a program, it's, it's from a program called Who Killed Mr Ward? And this is a, a, was a program about an Aboriginal man who died in the back of a prison van. Um, he'd been arrested on a drunk driving charge. Um, he'd been taken to Laverton Police Station, held overnight and then driven to jail. He was refused bail. He was driven to jail through the scorching heat of the day and by the time he arrived in Kalgoorlie he was dead. And later forensic showed that the metal on the back of the van where he was being held um, reached 56 degrees and when he collapsed on the van he got third degree burns on his belly to show that the aircon had broken down. The interview that you're going to see is an interview with the JP who refused him bail and it's, not a, it's, it's someone that no one had actually chosen to interview before but it always seemed to me that his part in this story um, should be told and I'm showing it partly because it's not a particularly aggressive interview, it's, and it's because it's with somebody, in a sense, who, despite what you might think of what they've done, in a sense, lacked the guile to lie or spin, and in a sense, just told you the basis on which he did what he did, and why, and, it's, and what's revealed by that is just the simple lack of care for what he regarded as a black fellow who'd gotten drunken on a Saturday night. The JP did convene a bail hearing the following morning. He conducted it standing at the door of Mr Ward's police cell. Ward was asleep when the JP arrived, but the police woke him up and the charges were read to him. He wasn't asked if he wanted a lawyer and bail was refused. It took about 10 minutes. Is that a properly constituted bail hearing? Um, Is that I, fair? I, well, put it this way, I, I presumed it was. I, I, I and other JPs had done that, uh, particularly when the people had been uh, severely uh, intoxicated or may have been violent and it was easier for the police to control them whilst they had them in the cell. But, but he wasn't this, a violent no, person? No, well, this, he, this, this person wasn't violent, no, I must admit. 
and uh, he was he was asleep when you yeah, arrived and he yes. was woken up and it was a 10 minute yes. hearing yes is yes. that the way you'd like your bail to be considered mm. to be woken up and have a 10 minute hearing um it's not unusual i mean if if but is uh, it fair <sighs> fair to whom to the prisoner the prisoners what well, but so you should think that the um, he should be wait uh, wait till about 12 noon until the person decides to wake up. Well, I thought 10 o'clock in the morning is a reasonable time to be woken. When Mr Thompson later gave evidence at the inquest, he revealed he hadn't actually done the JP's training course, but was instead relying on a booklet, which he'd not fully read. He couldn't remember what it said about considering bail. There were good arguments for and against. Mr Ward had breached bail on previous occasions, but then again, he had strong community connections. Mr Thompson did not consider them. So did you consider his local connections? Did you know that he was a well-respected... No. Y no. You weren't made aware of the fact that he's a cultural elder in no. Warburton, well-respected, well-connected? No. No. He was an Aboriginal, you know, very um, drunken state or very groggy state. That's all I knew him as. That's all I knew, and I think that's probably enough. There is one more following, but I won't play it, which, in which the Minister for Indigenous Affairs is held to account in a more particular way because of what was particularly disgraceful in that case was the fact that there'd been warnings precisely that a death was likely to happen. And her answers to that are just woeful. But I think we're probably running short yeah, of time. We probably, should, we probably should take some more questions. So, up to the microphone. Oh, there's one there. Yep. You were about to Next. ask a question before. I was before, yeah. Um, so my question is for Mark. Um, it's just around fact-checking um, and the processes that your program uh, goes through and indeed the processes that you might go through um, personally. Given that you know, facts are just so important, they, they can be so liberating for a journalist, but getting something wrong in an interview you know, can be de also devastating. Um, what sort of processes does your program go through when checking facts? What, what do you do personally, um, I guess, in the context of a daily current affairs program? Well, basically, I just read all the time. <laughs> and I collect information, uh, you know, as widely as I can. The reality of a program like PM is that uh, Jess Hill here is quite often going to give me three minutes notice of an interview. Um, because the Middle East is just waking up actually about now, or about say 4.15 or 4.30, and I'll just go into the studio and I, I need to be up to speed about Syria or Libya or Bahrain. And so, I mean, what can I tell you? That you gather information from as many sources as you can uh, and, you know, you keep files and you you know where the stuff where the where the stuff is and you know it's i just sort of do it every day i don't really think about it you know i, I don't know exactly what you what you want me to say do you have do you have any is there a, uh, something that you use a tip um you know that stops you or, or at least prevents you from from getting it wrong on air i'd call it google <laughs> yeah that's just, yeah but basically, if I, don't, if I don't know it, I'm not going to ask a question. You know, if, if I think I know something, but I don't know it, I won't ask the question based on it. But there's, as, as Liz says, there's, nobody ever died from being asked a question. Somebody should tell Alan Jones that. I don't know if you've seen the, <laughs> the video of him just being asked a question. Were you paid to be here today? The easiest thing would have been to say no. But instead, you know, he went off on a tear and uh, abused a couple of journalists to the most remarkable degree. But, you know, if, you don't, if I don't know the answer, then I'll, I'll ask the question in a way that is yeah. trying to get that information. Yeah, exactly. Another question? Um, you, have to go? you just talked about Alan Jones, and I know that he has quite a bit of a political pull because of the substantial amount of viewers that he gets in. What are your thoughts on that? You know, I don't... I don't well, really. All I can say is that the way Alan Jones is, does interviews is exactly the way I would counsel people not to do interviews. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. Um, you know, it's based on prejudice. It's based quite often on, 
on made-up facts or deliberate uh, misunderstanding or twisting of facts. Uh, it's just not my kind of thing and it's yeah. not Liz's and if either. He's if he's hostile, he says a great deal more than the person he's interviewing. They're lucky if they get a word in edgeways. Mm. <laughs> Uh, you talked about a few strategies to interview, either prepare your questions and kind of stick to it or listen and bounce uh, to, to the answers of the, the interviewee. So how do you find a good balance to have the, the best material, the best answers? No, I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, advocate preparing a list of questions and sticking to it. I advocate thinking about what you want and trying to get it, but not preparing a list of questions and sticking to it. In fact, some of the best interviews I have done have involved me saying, oh, is that what you think? Because mm. it's actually surprised me. And going off on a completely different angle. I think the listening, you, you know, it's the old line, listen, 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 the three great rules of, of interviewing. You must listen and you must react. Then there are technical things that you do. You, it's about trying to interrupt at the right moment. You can, if, you're, if you inter inter interrupt too much and too hard, the audience will see you as excessively hostile uh, and you'll lose the sympathy of the audience. If you, if you, if you ask questions in, in ways that are particularly uh, discourteous, you'll get the audience offside. But you always know that psychologically you are in the position of the listener or the viewer mm -hmm. and so in, in one way the advantage is usually with you it's yours to it's yours to throw away the there's a lot of psychological research that suggests that a, a politician an interviewee who tries to really savage the interviewer gets the audience offside because they feel that that's them you know, we're asking questions on their behalf. That's the subconscious feeling about it. I mean, I don't think so. Just to say, I don't think, you know, you may, in a long interview, there may be four areas or four points that you feel need to be addressed. Mm. I mean, probably not that many on a sort of on live radio, but, you know, you'd have a long interview where there, there would be four areas and you ought to have in your mind in terms of preparing what they are and what you're hoping are the questions that needed to be ans uh, answered in those areas. And, but I'm with Mark that nothing worse than looking as if you're reading prepared questions and within those areas you have to be just listen and and respond and that goes back to what I was said before about the strategy sorry is different from having a written question you know when I said it's important to have a strategy it's different from having a set yeah, of written yeah, questions absolutely yeah. it goes back to what I said before about knowing not only knowing what you want but knowing when you've got it so you have as you do more interviews as you've as you have more experience in it you have a little counter in your brain that says, yeah, I've got that, That'll, that can work there, because you will have already pre-scripted to, to a degree. That'll be very neat there. Now what I still need is this. So the more you know about what you want and what you have or, you know, when you've got it, then the easier it is to go on to the next bit. Okay, two, two more you. quick questions. Thank you, Mark and, and Liz. And then we must wrap because Mark's got a little well, program got, on. I've got, I've got just about five or ten minutes but, before I really okay. have to rush. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Um, my question is partly about post-production, but I think it's also about interviewing because it informs the way that you ask your questions. <clears throat> Liz, um, your interview with Selwyn, Selwyn showed how important it is to leave pauses in there. But on the other hand, if you're listening to a radio piece that's five minutes long and there are three minutes of ums and ahs, that's just excruciating. How much can you take out of these interviews and still preserve their integrity? Well, I think television is very different from radio in some senses. I mean, I think that works in television but clearly wouldn't work in radio. And I think there are some things that you, sometimes an expression on a face can tell you a whole lot in television where it's not going to, you ask a question that someone doesn't expect and just the look on their face will give you a whole lot of information that you don't otherwise get. So I think, you know, perhaps it's a tangential answer to your question, but that isn't an interview, that a level of pausing I wouldn't put. Well, actually, if it's, if it's surrounded by other interviews, you know what I mean, like if it's in the middle of an interview, a longer interview, it can work. I, I do believe that pausing does work in radio, but that grab alone would work on television, but would only work in a context on radio. Does that I an do answer? a lot. Sorry, mm. I do a lot of de-umming, a lot. Do you? Uh, of pre-recorded interviews. Yeah. yeah. 
And it is one, different, one big difference, actually, is that um, if I was doing a pre-recorded interview for television, sometimes I would, if I would get them to do it again, or I'd go back and g keep asking the same question until yep. they were a lot more fluent. With radio, I can just de-um. Uh, that's what we call it. It's de-umming and ahhing and cosmetic pause, editing, pause removal <laughs> and all of that. Sorry? I, cosmetic editing. I yeah, it just cosmetic. speeds everything up, you know. It just uh, Nip and tuck. Uh, uh, yeah. And, but I would still leave some pauses in if they're, you know, psychologically interesting. If it's, if you, it, sometimes you do ask somebody a question that they really are taken aback by and you get a three or four second pause and it's quite worth leaving that in sometimes. Um, my question's a bit difficult to ask purely because I understand the importance of asking quite difficult questions. Um, but I, I noticed a big contrast between the Garrett interview, where the first question was a very basic question that Garrett just refused to answer. So there had to be a consistent line of when, when did this happen? But with the Howard and the Justice of the Peace interviews, is there some risk that you position the audience in a certain way by asking the questions, I guess, in a certain tone. Like, with the how did interview, I don't think it's as important, because although the questions were quite, I guess, difficult, Howard is a polished interviewee, like he knows what's coming and he answers the questions, he's accustomed to it. But with the Justice of the Peace interview, as a viewer, I felt quite sympathetic towards the Justice of the Peace, even though he wasn't actually a sympathetic character. And I think that was because of the way in which he was portrayed and he looked as though he was someone who didn't know how he was being portrayed. Yeah. I mean, I think there is a problem if, if you feel that the tone is setting you against someone, that you, the tone of the questions is setting you against someone who actually think is quite a likeable person. I mean, I, 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 would, I would hope that wasn't the case in that. I mean, I didn't feel it was a particularly aggressive tone in use. And I mean, I think that he was someone who wasn't, who, as I said, in a way lacked guile and, and wasn't lying and wasn't spinning and something for which I respected him for. I mean, in, in, in the longer interview, he simply says things, you know, that, that are what he thinks. And I don't think... But the, the outcome of, of that kind of way in which he's behaving is a, does serve a real injustice to the... I mean, he's, he's operating as a JP. He's never read anything other than half a booklet. He's determining issues about... The, the, in this instance, the life and death issues about whether or not someone is going to get bailed on a drunk driving charge or whether or not they're going to go to jail. So I don't feel that the tone was too harsh. But I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm aware, I mean, I, I do take, it's the same as if a politician is too aggressive towards the interviewer, the sympathies will go with the interviewer. If the interviewer is too aggressive the other way, then you'll lose. And I, I mean, I, I would plead guilty to that in a later interview with John Howard. Um, but I wouldn't plead guilty to it in relation to the magistrate. I was going to show you the one in which I pleaded guilty, but it was so long. <laughs> it was really a question about how many times can you ask the same question over and over again before you should just duck out and say, OK, game over. <laughs> uh -huh. You're not going to answer. Uh -huh. I, I do, uh, the only thing I've got to add is I do think that tone is incredibly important. You can, you can wreck an interview by using the wrong tone, mm -hmm. But if you get the tone right, and as I say, it's often a matter not only of the tone of your voice and the quality of your questions, but it's also about uh, the timing. And you really just have to work on your timing as to when you can jump in, when you can contradict somebody or, or really go in hard. All of those things come with experience, but the experience is really worth getting. So any exercises that you can do, any... Uh, you know, if you're a student, you know, and you, you can go and work on student radio and get do as much interviewing as you can. Every interview you do of whatever sort, whether it's a friendly interview or, uh, you know, any kind of interviewing is experience and you, you learn from everyone. Well, I think that's a wonderful place to end. Thanks very much to um, Mark Colvin and Liz Jackson for their time today. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks.